So welcome, and thanks for joining us for a discussion co-sponsored by EdAction Forum of Maine and The Source School. So this is the third in a series of cross-sector discussions on the topic of education in Maine. Our previous two discussions focused on innovative mindsets and imagination, and both of those are available on our, our websites. Today, our focus is investment in education. So in this discussion today, we have Javier Botana, the superintendent of Portland Public Schools, and Dr. Lori Lachance, president of Thomas College, and Chris Wolfell, director of entrepreneurship at the Rue Institute. So thank you all very much for making the time to join this discussion. So what do we mean by investment today? We're gonna to leave this as broad as possible, but in the essence, the discussion is meant to explore individuals, organizations, <clears throat> communities, giving something of themselves, something of value, something meaningful to support the educational growth and well-being of another individual community of learners, educational institution. So we're interested in hearing from you three as leaders of a variety of educational institutions, but also as learners yourselves, your thoughts on what investment in education means to you personally, but also for students and schools, and even maybe your organization, Maine as a whole. So Javier, could we start with you? Um, and I would just ask if you could describe briefly your role um, and, and what leads you to invest yourself in this position in the educational realm. Sure, um, Javier Botan, I'm the superintendent of schools here in Portland. So um, I make all the snow day calls and that's what superintendents do. Um, so, um, you know, obviously I'm the CEO of the organization. So um, as that, I, you know, um, help to, um, you know, manage all aspects of the operation, but also uh, more importantly, uh, help to set the vision and direction and you know strategies for um for meeting our um uh you know for meeting our vision and, and goals um so that's um you know my role as superintendent i tell this story often that you know um my first you know sort of um major recollection as a child was you know a conversation with my grandmother we um, we came to the United States from Cuba after the um, Cuban Revolution, and you know we were just talking, and she, um, you know, she was um, contrasting the experiences that we were having in this country, um, you know, with my mom who had a college education that you know that my grandma and her uh, husband, my grandfather, had been able to. Um, to provide for her and you know she knew um, a good amount of English coming here and so she quickly got placed into a sort of a career track and um, was doing well and my grandfather who obviously had paid for her education you know with his hard work um, he was a small business owner in Cuba and didn't have an education and lost everything and was in you know what he considered a job that was um, you know not up to his expectations and um, you know what he wanted to have and so I remember her saying that uh, you know that an education is the only thing that nobody will ever be able to take from you and you know so that has always been the um, you know, sort of the spark that ignited my uh, commitment to this profession and you know i use that story because i think it's incredibly relevant in my um, current context both as an educator and also you know the leader of a school district that has you know a significant number of um, you know individuals who had similar experiences to those of my family and you know for whom you know, sort of the reminder that this is, you know, this, the reason that you're here in many cases is to achieve a level of education that um, nobody can take from you, even though you may have lost um, a lot in trying to, you know, make the journey here. Chris, would you go next? Yeah, I'm Chris Wolf. I'm the Director of Entrepreneurship here at the Ruhr Institute, and ultimately my team and I are um, one of the pillars across the Institute whose mission is to drive economic development in Maine by 
um, providing research, learning, entrepreneurship opportunities in the life sciences and advanced technology space. And we do that all with an incredible set of partners, both corporate and academic. Uh, my team specifically focuses on educating, supporting, and incubating entrepreneurs and startups. And you know, this is something that to me, I, I look at entrepreneurship as an incredible tool for both economic development for a region, but also economic mobility for individuals. It allows people to really take control of their futures. And that's what you know draws me to this. I, I was an entrepreneur. I started a few companies beforehand and lots of people gave anywhere from one hour, 15 minute phone call to people that met with me on weekly and monthly basis for a long period of time. And you know, that form of education to me was, you know, that, that investment per se, in, in this case, that they put in time in myself and some of the companies I was working on was a phenomenal um, transformer for myself, my career and, and my family. And I think that's something that, that drives me to give back to, you know, those people that took an hour, took weeks to, to support me along the way and gets me up every morning to help one more entrepreneur have that light bulb go off or, you know, have a, a big win in their business and, you know, feel just as much pride for, for watching that grow as sometimes even more than when I was building my own businesses, watching others be successful has just really driven me for, for a long time and, you know, fortunate to do that here in Maine. Wonderful. And thank you for coming to me. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Lori? Well, hi, I'm Lori Lachance. I'm the president of Thomas College. And Thomas, for those who don't know, it is just a place of hope and opportunity. Uh, about two thirds of our students are first in their family to go to college. And we serve predominantly Maine kids and predominantly of more humble, humble means. Um, I grew up in Dover Foxcroft, a little town in the center of the state, and had a phenomenal childhood, great education, um, thought when I graduated from high school, all things were possible, uh, went to Bowdoin College and then started a career as an economist, um, working at Central Maine Power, um, uh, working as a state economist for three governors and then running the Maine Development Foundation. So in my first 28 years of my career, um, I spent all my time forecasting and analyzing the state. I traveled to every corner of it. I've probably been in virtually every town. I absolutely love, I love my hometown. I love my state. And all those years in looking at every form of economic development, I grew to understand that the single greatest investment we can make in our future is bringing every single person to their greatest potential. And Somehow magically, when I was offered the job of college president, because I, I'm a non-traditional president, I actually don't have my doctorate. Uh, thank you for promoting me, but um, I'm certainly not promoting you. <laughs> but um, um, the power of education, education is the equalizer. It is the opportunity for everyone to reach their potential if we can find a way um, to give them a path to their highest, highest achievement in education. So when I landed at Thomas, it was like a dream come true of a dream I, I could never have even imagined. And um, being here, we, we just see miracles happen all the time. And it is a joy. It is hard work, especially in a pandemic, but it is such a joy to see the transformation. All right, so maybe that actually leads over kind of nicely to the next question I wanted to ask you all. And that was just, if you could take, take anyone who's watching this back to when you were a student at whatever age you want to share, what kind of student were you? What did you think of school? How did you interact with your education institutions, whether you were in kindergarten or college? Something that meaningful to, to you. I'm, I'm happy to jump in while, while it gives people time to collect their thoughts. I'll take the entrepreneur approach and just go for it. Um, I, I mean, I, I probably was, was, a, I was a roller coaster student, right? I, I had times that I was a great student and times that my, my family was probably like, Oh, 
don't don't know if he's gonna gonna even make it through this. And part of it was because I gravitated towards certain subjects and others I couldn't keep my eyes open. Um, and to me, right, at, I had kind of had that original pressure of everything you need. You know, my my family was kind of the hey, everyone needs all A's. Um, I realized really quickly that wasn't going to be me. And I was fortunate to have a few people along the way that kind of said, hey, pick the few things that you're really good at and, and focus on those. And you know, I think for me, I, I kind of directionally bounced around for a while until actually all the way until college and had, you know, I'd kind of taken the, oh, I'm going to go do the become a lawyer because someone said I should be a lawyer. And then someone, oh, I'm going to go do this because someone said this. And I was fortunate to find someone that said, what do you want to do? and kind of freed me up to kind of look at it a bit differently. And there, that allowed me to get into, and fortunately um, I did go, I did my undergraduate at Northeastern University. And part of that was because of the experiential learning model that they had, right? So for me, I was ready to go work as soon as possible. Let me go work. I mean, I'd worked in metal fab shops and construction sites in high school and was always like, how do I get there and do something? And getting into a world where I was able to do internships and co-ops and different models to like play around, like then connecting it helped me, right? The pure classroom side was never a, a great fit for me. I, you know, did well, but um, once I was able to actually apply and connect it to what I was trying to do with the rest of my life was, was kind of for me, a little bit of my, my journey. And I think that that's something that I've come to realize really the the well-rounded kind of you know perfect in everything is it's not for everyone. Um, there's definitely people out there. I've I've got a lot of friends that just for some reason everything they pick up academically they they run home runs um, or they just they succeed in it. But for me, it was really finding the connection to the real world that that made it tangible for me. And I actually think I probably value. And I've come to even value the education more than I've, and even before this role at, at the at the institute. But but realizing how important that was, I didn't I didn't realize it as a student. I realized it as soon as I stopped being a student and graduated, was out in the real world. I was like, oh, you know, this the only reason I'm able to do these is because of that educational base that I I had. So hmm. I don't know if I really answered your question there, but that was yeah, very kind much of so. my my journey, and it, it's you know probably not surprising from the entrepreneur, it wasn't exactly linear. Yeah, you might be interested in, um, in watching one of our previous conversations in which Patrick Breeding was speaking, another entrepreneur, Marin Skincare, and very similar story. I, I actually um, love his story, similar to yours, where he came to his, his understanding of what he was meant to be doing, not until college. And it really was because someone gave him the space and the time and the support to experiment and find that. It's interesting in some ways. Um, I I, um, I think a lot of my experience is similar to Chris's, um, and you know I think that's uh, somewhat surprising given you know my um, earlier conversation about you know the the sort of uh, uh, the drive for an education and the um, importance of it. Um, I was a lackluster student um, pretty much through high school, and you know didn't really have a firm understanding on what I really wanted to do. Um, I thought I might, you know, want to do something, you know, I was originally a biology major. I wanted to do something that was sort of applied science, you know, um, uh, like, you know, out in the, uh, doing field work out in like Alaska, something like that was what I thought I really wanted to do. And, you know, we didn't really have the, means for what my um, father thought was a fairly esoteric pursuit. And um, so he said, how about teaching? And, you know, cause he um, knew somebody who could get me a scholarship um, to be an education major. And so I was like, teaching is good. You know, I, um, the, you know, even though I was a lackluster student, I was always, um, I always had uh, teachers along the way that I was really impressed by or, you know, really felt a connection with. And they were, you know, people who really um, focused on building relationships with their students and treating 
their um, you know students as um, you know as learners and as people who were you know in formation. And I think that that was what made um, you know uh, teaching something that I really thought would um, you know would be good, given that you know um, my sort of dream of um, counting caribou in Alaska was not um, likely to materialize. So, which is kind of funny because now you couldn't get me to camp to save my life. But at the time that seemed like something that I really wanted to do. Mm. Well, that's funny because my dreams growing up were to be in the fifth dimension as a singer. Um, not just <laughs> a singer, but to be in the fifth dimension, you know, that's <laughs> being Aquarius and whatnot. So <laughs> my uh, growing years uh, in Dover Foxcroft were, were phenomenal. A great education, loved the teachers, felt respected and cared about by them all the way through. Uh, particular teachers really influenced my life. I was the youngest of three children, kind of a whoopsie baby. So I had older <laughs> parents and quite a bit of space between me and my older sisters but I adored them and wanted to be just like them. And even though they were very different. So I tried to draw um, from their attributes and, and become more like them. Um, but, but I was the, I was like the goody two shoes student, straight A's, top of my class. Um, I was the kid that if someone wanted to go out, you know, to a party or an event, they'd say, oh, well, Lori's going and then they'd get to go. Um, so just kind of this uh, path of seemingly, you know, doing everything I was supposed to do and always felt just very, very happy and very honored and very um, uh, just that I could do well educationally. Um, and then I went to college and that's when life changed. <laughs> uh, well, it changed in, in strange ways. I, I ended up at an elite school. Um, but I ended up very naively there, having absolutely no idea what kind of school it was, absolutely no idea that it was one of the top 10 in the nation, um, uh, no idea of uh, the types of students that came there. And at that time, it was a very small percentage that came from Maine. And um, for the first time in my life, um, I felt like an, I learned what feeling like an imposter was because I felt like there's absolutely no way I should be here. I don't deserve to be here. I'll never survive this. I'm not smart enough. I'm not smart as smart as every other person here. I don't wear the right clothing. I don't drive the right car. My parents didn't have the right jobs. Um, every aspect of my life was in question, which I'd never felt before. So it shook me to my very core and yet, it probably gave me the greatest gift of my life. And particularly now when you fast forward to where I work because I learned humility, I learned the hard work. Um, I learned that every challenge holding me back was not a lack of ability or drive. It was all in my head. It was everything, all the fears that are in your mind that you don't belong. Um, you just simply don't belong and you're not good enough. And, um, you know, I, because of my enormous love for music, and I've been involved in music and sports all the way up through, um, I was able to do those things at college and find myself that there were people like me and that I did deserve to be there and whatnot. And that resilience that was learned and that kind of love of the underdog and appreciation of the underdog and commitment to the underdog, I think has driven absolutely everything I've done in my life. So um, it ended up being an absolutely transformative and powerful experience, but uh, it started uh, pretty painfully. It's a surprise turn to the story. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, after a while, when you get out of your own head, you know, but you get out of your own head, there was nobody in that age. It was in the late 70s, early 80s when I was in college, and you didn't like talk about your feelings. There weren't all these books that you could read on, you know, feel good about yourself. And <laughs> you know, it just, you didn't talk about it. 
and quitting wasn't an option. Transferring didn't, I had no idea anybody could transfer. So you got it out and, um, you know, whereas I knew every teacher I'd ever had, I was too scared to go talk to the teachers there, the professors. And what a waste. What, that's why you go to a small <laughs> liberal arts school is to get to know the faculty. But, you know, when students come from more humble backgrounds, um, they don't know that's at their disposal. There's a certain entitlement that perhaps they don't hold. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Yeah, you actually <laughs> don't feel you're entitled to anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that resonates um, with you, Hire or Chris, in your experiences um, of education. And so feel free to jump in if you'd like to, to add something on that, or we can move on to the, the next question. Yeah, I think, I mean, the, the part that um, resonated for me was particularly this notion of um, getting out of your um, getting out of your head and, you know, um, being of, you know, a similar um, time frame, you know, just how, um, you know, how stressful and, um, and um, challenging it was to live under those um, circumstances where, um, you know, sort of being, um, you know, being in your head was considered a sign of weakness and, um, you know, something that you needed to overcome. And, you know, how, um, you know, the sort of the balance between resiliency and, you know, sort of um, uh, stress and really not being, not being able to be your best self was, you know, resulted from, you know, not being able to, you know, not feeling able to go and and um, and find help when you would have definitely wanted it or needed it. Yeah, and, and there's one thing that kind of popped to mind while Laura was kind of talking about that, you know, I don't belong here, imposter syndrome type feeling. I I was, you know, I was fortunate that I I would say elementary school, et cetera, I started to shift towards the, my grades were declining, I think more because I was bored. Like if it was a, a subject I didn't care, I didn't care. If it was something I wanted to be challenged in, it was great. And I was fortunate enough to, to go to a, a small boarding school um, in Connecticut. And while I was there, it was a, the first thing really quickly was the same thing. You're like, whoa, either whether it was brains or means, I was like, I don't fit here. Um, and looking at that, even looking back, I, I probably didn't even process it until Lori's comments about the education of kind of the, the emotional intelligence and the, the meeting other people. I mean, I ended up, I lived there for four, you know, from the age of 14 to 18, I lived in the woods with 350 other guys on a thousand acres, right? It was, it was a very broad experience with, you know, people from down the street, but people from Japan in the same school. And like, I had not experienced that before. And that once I think I was able to kind of get to that point of like, oh, I do belong here in some way, shape or form or found that way is that served me very well in future situations. I'm sure Lloyd probably the same thing, right? Like when I started my first software company, we raised our first venture around and i I was 22 years old. There's probably a lot of rooms I probably shouldn't have been, but in a way I just gotten so used to that, like, eh, well, that's a feeling I felt for 10 years. It doesn't matter anymore. And I think there's, there's something to be said for, for that too, of just getting thrown into a scenario and you live through it. Then the next time it's easier, the next time it's easier, the next time it's easier. Yeah. I feel like that can, that can really easily lead over to the, the next question I'd love to ask you. And again, just whoever feels moved to speak first can just jump in. Do you have any specific examples of a time when someone invested in you in your educational growth, you know, financially or personally, moral support, advice, any anything that just comes to mind that you feel would be meaningful to share? Yeah, I have a couple of examples. Um, they both come from uh, my time at Central Maine Power. CMP was just a great company to work for, and um, they paid for 85% of my master's degree. 
And um, ironically, you know, I'm a first gen from humble roots. I thought a college degree from a prestigious college was plenty. And I had uh, been at CMP a couple of years working really, really hard, long hours. And a new female uh, vice president came in from outside, the first female vice president there. And she told me outright, I'll never promote you if you don't get your master's, which you know, was really upsetting. Like, what do you mean? And who needs a master's degree? But that was the greatest thing that, that I could have done. I had no idea um, the doors that would open and as you look at the other jobs I've been able to have in my career, I would not have been hired. I would not even have been considered for any of them um, if I hadn't had my master's degree. And so she invested me by, in me by challenging me and the company paid for it. And um, it, it really unleashed opportunities that I would never have imagined but I'm so thankful for in hindsight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. My, um, you know, the example that I thought of was um, similar in, in, you know, in my own context, which was, you know, as a, um, as a young teacher, I, you know, I went to workshops and did all of those things. And somewhere along the line, um, I was asked to do some summer work um, developing curriculum for, um, refugees in um, in refugees in refugee camps in Southeast um, Asia, and so you know the job involved going and working with other teachers um, over the summer at this um, at this center that did um, professional development and things along those lines, and so um, it was there that you know the director of the center, you know um, we just started talking and before you know it, he sort of took me under his wing and, you know, um, just said, like, you have tremendous potential. You could do so many other things in education. Um, and, you know, I had never at that point thought of going back for a graduate degree. I hadn't thought about administration or anything along those lines, but it was, you know, sort of the, um, the attention and inspiration that I got from um, from this man, from uh, Ron Perlman, to actually think about like there's lots of other things in education that you could be doing that um, was inspiring and um, got me started down graduate school and eventually to where I am today. I, I hear both of you talking about about this and these graduate school paths and and you know for for me that was it was a different route. Um, you know I, I remember actually having that conversation at at one point with one of my mentors saying, what do I, I do here? Should I, I, I almost jumped right into graduate school the, the minute, like I was, I didn't know what I was going to do after graduating. And I had one person say, you know what, take two to three years and work in the world, then go back to graduate school. Like think about it in that arc. And looking back at it, that allowed me to look at, you know, when we start, when I, I joined up with, with my co-founders, my first company, it was a, I had the freedom in a way to fail where they said, you know what, go try it. If it works great, if it doesn't work, you have a bunch of experience and then you can go be even absorb the learning more on the, on the graduate program. And again, that was a decision that, you know, I, I was that one mentor multiple times was like, are you doing what people tell you you should do or what you think people should do or what you want to do? And and using that as a way to make the decisions, even down to, you know, courses. I remember sitting with one of them once and being like, I, I have to take these like six electives, like, or four electives, whatever it was. Do I go take, you know, underwater scuba diving or do I take something that like is interesting and viable? And they're the one they're like, hey, you're, you're investing your time in this, right? Is it, is it worth it? And that, you know, ended up, you know, me, instead of taking a bunch of courses that, you know, were probably valuable, but not as valuable as I took a, a, some, a summer program and got to go down to Costa Rica and do a sustainable business program where we took two or three courses. And yeah, it was a lot harder work than taking the history <laughs> of film or scuba diving. But looking back at it, 
for me, those like those little pushes and connecting it back to real world, like that was that was the thing that I think of more as like the more I could connect things to ta- like tangible, how would this go? And you know, I had those those one or two mentors that time and time again would looking back, probably coach in the right direction, but knowing if they had said, take this course, I would have gone the opposite way intentionally. Um, so I think that was, that was an important factor on my end. There are all different kinds of students. <laughs> yeah. And, and I mean, I also think for me, it was, I, I, I really enjoyed building and making things and, and the ability to be encouraged to like, let that creative side go out right my I've you know got some some artists in the family and and that side of me and ended up gravitating more towards marketing right like I I think I enrolled in Northeastern thinking I was going to be a lawyer and then I was like I'll do finance or accounting and I realized like that's not how my brain was wired and like being able to to apply and connect the things that I was passionate about and got me excited definitely put me on a different track Mm. You know, when I think of um, your story compared with Lori, your story in particular, <clears throat> it seems that, you know, we have a variety of different, and, and Javier, this is your, your day-to-day life. There are so many different ways of learning, <laughs> so many different kinds of students, right? And so how do we have a system, a system um, in, a, in, a, in its wholeness that really allows for and supports even investment in different kinds of learners? And their success. I heard one of you say a while ago that what really inspires you is this idea of helping everyone reach their highest potential. And that was what inspired me as a teacher, for sure, when I was teaching. Um, and so I just wonder if any of the three of you, and Javier, I don't know if you may have the most specific example right away or not, but are there ways that we can, either as schools or as teachers or as, as, as a system as a whole, invest in, in avenues through which different stu- different types of students can thrive and reach their highest potential. So I'm leaving that question as broad as possible um, because I think each of you will have a very different kind of answer. I mean, I think that that is what we all strive for. And I will, um, you know, I think readily admit that as, um, you know, the, the um, sort of the traditional um, pre-K through, 12 into, you know, adult learning institutions, um, you know, have, you know, do not have all of the answers for that um, by any stretch of the imagination. And I think that, you know, that that is a a weakness and a, you know, sort of a, a, you know, a gap that exists in society that, um, you know, I don't think, traditional pre-K through, you know, um, uh, 12 type of institutions are necessarily at fault for that, but certainly, you know, are not um, on the cutting edge of solving for it either. So I do think that that is, you know, the, um, the challenge for us that has been, you know, sort of laid bare, if you will, you know, um, in COVID pushing us to think about other ways that we might be able to reach students and you know see if there are um, alternative approaches to meeting those needs. I mean, we've we've had in the pre-K-12 space, um, you know, sort of little side operations that have attempted to meet the needs of students who are you know not just going to go to school you know at eight o'clock in the morning and be done at. 315, do my homework, maybe do some sports and stuff like that, and then, you know, get up and do it all over again. Um, We've had like little um, outposts within our institutions, but not uh, truly a way of being able to meet those needs. And so we've, you know, and I think you can hear that from, you know, our own sort of experiences here, you know, um, where, you know, it's worked really well for some and, you know, so-so for others and, you know, we also know not at all for a significant number of people. And so I think that's, um, you know, a long way of saying that I don't have great examples. Um, I know that it's a, um, you know, sort of a, a, a hole in, 
you know, the institution that I lead and the institutions that are like the one that I that I lead and, you know, anxious always to engage in conversations with people about ways of, you know, trying to meet those needs, um, knowing that, you know, that's the, that's what we all strive for. One, one thing this makes me also think of is, is not to forget kind of how we look at a definition of a learner and learning. Um, you know, I, I, believe wholeheartedly in the value of lifelong learning. And that might mean for some people it's bit by bit. And, you know, to, to the, the point just raised, not everyone is eight to five, four years in a row, five years in a row, et cetera. Um, or things change throughout someone's life. Um, you know, we have a, a program, for example, at the Rowan Institute called Align, which is focused on how do you help people transition their careers into computer science? which normally has a couple different pathways into it. It might be someone that never studied a STEM field 15, 20 years ago because it wasn't in, in their life path. It wasn't as accepted as it should have been for people to pursue those fields. So we have a program there that's designed to how do you take someone and give them the skills they need to end up with a master's in computer science, right? It's, it's something designed for that mobility and it's, there's plenty of people that take it, you know, the, it's designed to be, yeah, you could be right after your, your liberal arts, amazing liberal arts education. You want to wrap a master's in computer science around it. That's great. But it also could be, you know, you spent 20 years and were a technician in a um, dentist's office and you said, you know what, I want to actually learn this. How do I, how do I bridge that skill? Um, so creating programs that allow flexible pathways for people to to change right i think that's we've seen it and a little bit in the, the prep for this we're talking about you know what does the future of work look like 10 20 years from now and there'll still be a certain population of people that have one career and they'll finish their education whether that's you know a two-year technical college whether that's just high school whether that's a master's or a phd and some of them will do that same career the whole time but I believe many people will have five to 10 year, whether it's at a company or an industry, right? We're even seeing people that might work in a certain industry or field for 10 or 15 years and then do a complete change. And I think the way, the only way you can make those changes successful is there's got to be an education and whether that education is, you know, skill development or mastery of advanced technical skills, like there's, there's got to be models that allow for that flexibility um, for people lifelong. Um, I think that's an incredibly important piece. Um, and it also makes it more accessible for people that, you know, not everyone can drop everything and, and do an intensive two, four, six month, week, year program. It's how do you make it approachable and accessible for anyone? And I think that's got to be looked at a little bit different than the traditional confines of you go into class eight to eight to four. And that's more on the, the higher ed post, you know, post the K to 12 side. And um, that's kind of the one thought that I, I'd like to add there. Now, as you were speaking, I was thinking, oh, what would that look like for seventh through 12th graders, say? Say we think of one to six as a foundation. And then after that, that's more, that just, you know. Javier, you, did you just unmute? Did you want to add something? No, I was, I was going to say that that was my thought too, that that is, you know, that's exactly what I was saying is like, what are the ways in which we can do that in the, um, you know, the K through, you know, pre-K through 12 um, sector and particularly around, you know, um, adolescence and, you know, time when, you know, kids are developing at very different rates that have lots of different things that are, you know, um, working um, on their bodies and minds. And, you know, that, um, you know, the, the way that we're structured has very little room for that level of variation. Um, that, you know, obviously be, um, you know, that's, that's the challenge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Laura, did you want to add anything? Yeah, it's interesting because I sit in the higher ed sphere and um, we spend an enormous amount of our time and energy um, 
trying to lift many, many individuals uh, for things they didn't receive earlier in their life um, and get them through the rigor of college and uh, to the other side. And we're really, really successful at it, but it's, uh, you know, Herculean efforts to do it. And um, so if any of you have ever heard me talk about the economy and education, um, in part by what I see every day and, and while miracles happen, I know they could happen a lot easier and to a lot more people if we started earlier, much earlier. And so forgive me being a broken record, but if we do not change our systems to investing from birth to five, we will never ever achieve the vision we want for our education system, just never. Um, I see it at Educare Central Maine. I've been on their board for 10 years. Um, there are children who grow up in real poverty, um, sometimes broken families, sometimes dysfunction and, and worse. Um, and when they go through that high quality evidence-based care and early education, they enter kindergarten ready to learn. If you enter, enter kindergarten ready to learn, when you hit second, third, fourth grade, you are able like your classmates to go from learning to read to reading to learn. But if you start out behind in kindergarten, you never catch up. If by fourth grade, you're not ready to le read so that you can learn the advanced topics, you just get further and further behind. Um, so for me with 90% of a child's brain developing before the age of five, kindergarten is just too late. And four year olds, while it's nice, is not enough, it needs to start earlier. So um, I think that's where the game changer is. And if we could just change our mindset and move resources um, to really true high quality early care, early from birth care and education, um, we, we could totally change the experience that they have in K-12, um, the experience that they have and the opportunity they have in college and beyond. So that's, mm. I think for me, that's just, there are many, many things we could do and, and do better, but that's the one we got to get right. Well, it's the foundation. It's the beginning of all the rest. So that, that does make, that just makes logical sense. So kind of connecting all of those, we have these gaps, you know, as Javier, you said in the, in the system and Lori, you really focusing on this lack of unwillingness on, on, on our part, let's just say on our, all of our parts in the, in the state, because we are as a, as a whole community here, um, to really invest in the early education. Um, are there some, well, first of all, clearly schools can't do it by themselves or they would have. So let's just say schools, uh, preschools, um, K-12 schools, universities, perhaps can't always provide for all these different ways of learning and all this in the different, in the foundation that you spoke about, Lori. Are there some ways or some places, some opportunities um, for investment of some sort to really shift this? So maybe it's investment of, of attention, but beyond that even, is there a way, a crack we can go into and, and make some change? I will say that we, uh, when we were working with the governor's economic recovery committee, um, we identified eight major investments that were necessary for the economy to not just survive this pandemic, but, but thrive afterwards. And one of the eight was early childhood investment. And uh, uh, another one of the eight had to do with investing in diversity, equity, and, and inclusion because those are, we learned through the pandemic, the most disadvantaged populations in our state um, by far. So um, what has happened is when government grows to understand the importance of these types of investment and philanthropy steps up as they have in Maine and the business sector through the, the very power that they hold not only to invest, but to raise awareness to and to affirm this is an important and worthwhile investment. And we're, we're starting to really see that some business leaders 
who are stepping up as incredible leaders with towards this vision. And when the business leaders are involved and the government puts its many resources to it and philanthropy joins hands in the same way, that's where we start to move the needle. And we're really starting to see that in Maine. Mm-hmm. And, and the one thing I would even add to that is also all of the institutions need to work together, right? We, you know, I know, I know Lori well, and we work together very closely and Javier, I know works with other folks on our team. And like, this is a no single entity or organization or person can can solve this challenge in a vacuum, right? There's no, you know, hero that's going to swoop in and, and save us all and, and fix this. This is something that can only be done when everyone looks at this as how do we work together to rise the tides on this? Because it is something that affects every single person in the state and the country. If if they're blind to it or or well aware, it it, in, it it impacts them all. So it is something that requires a level of collaboration and, and open thinking that, you know, I, I've been, you know, just amazed at some of the stuff over the last 12 to 24 months I, I've seen come together across multiple organizations, public, private, and, and education-wise. But there's still more to go, right? There, there's no way you can say, yes, check, we're done. And that'll actually never happen, right? This is gonna be something that even if we can, we can fix everything, then you can improve it. So um, I, I couldn't have said it better, Lori. And, and it, it is something that all of these organizations working together will be the only way to, to solve this. Yeah, I don't, I don't have anything that I can add um, beyond that, I think, you know, um, Chris's final point, I think, about the fact that this is not a, you know, um, it's not, a, I don't want to say it's not a solvable problem. It is, you know, it's not a problem that is ever solved for good. It's, we're always going to continue to need to sharpen the um, focus and, you know, continue to make improvements. I don't think that, you know, um, that we should ever look at this as something like, you know, oh, you know, we're going to do these four different things. And that, in that area, I sort of, um, I, I, I hear you, Lori, about the importance of early childhood education, but we're also dealing with, you know, kids who are, you know, coming to us who that, ship has sailed. And, you know, for us to just say, like, let's go and, you know, make sure that everybody, you know, in the future has this um, is not, uh, you know, is not uh, a fail safe solution either. So I think that, you know, continuing to work together, continuing to work cross sectors, you know, um, leveraging each other and committing to the fact that this is something that is not going to be done in any of our lifetimes is, I think, um, uh, that, you know, I, that's what I take away from that. Mm. Javier, do you have any um, examples of, of um, organizations that you have partnered with or have um, or investments that have been made or investments that are being made in the Portland Public Schools where you feel like the needle is moving a little? In budget? I, mean, I don't know that the need that I can you know put my finger on this is the needle is moving, but I think one of the things that has always um, struck me, um, you know, in my career is, you know, the, the fact that, you know, there's, um, you know, the importance of, you know, sort of um, student voice and listening to parents. And at the same time, you know, we tend to um, always listen to the same students and the same parents. And so I think one of the things that I'm um, excited about, and it's, you know, very much in its um, infancy, but, you know, for us to, um, you know, we've been working um, with the, with uh, Portland Empowered, which is a local nonprofit that does a lot of work to engage um, and raise up the voices of those who've traditionally not been at the table. And, you know, Nellie May uh, Foundation, you know, to sort of Lori's uh, point earlier about, you know, the 
um, new vision coming out of philanthropy for some of this has invested in um, putting us and Portland Empowered um, main um, uh, Inside Out, which is an organization that works with, you know, students who have been in the criminal justice system and um, Portland Outright, an organization working um, with um, students who are, you know, identify um, gender expansive in, you know, multiple ways, putting us together to try to figure out how do we actually bring those voices to the table in these conversations as opposed to, you know, and I have, and we have amazing students who are, you know, um, born leaders and are showing that leadership um, day in and day out in conventional places. But I've always been struck about the fact that, you know, the kids that we're most concerned about, they're never at the table to have these conversations. So how do we actually work to get, you know, those students and their families at the table as we're having these um, conversations. Um, so I think that that's where I believe that that's a place where we can actually, um, you know, move the needle if we're able to get those voices to engage in ways that they've traditionally not engaged. Mm -hmm. I know that you've held a, a meeting not that long ago for one of those groups of families that was really well attended and the families seemed very grateful for the opportunity to be able to speak in their in their um, native language, their, the language they speak at home, and, and to have your presence there as, as very welcoming and kind of um, really seeking their input, actively seeking their input. I think yeah. that's just a, an example. Yeah, and that's one of the early efforts to actually do that, um, do that type of work. But, you know, again, just the beginning of that, but I do think that that's a place where, um, you know, if we want to really figure out what are the reasons why, you know, in this particular case, Latinx um, students aren't coming to school. Um, I think asking them and their families is probably the best place to really, um, you know, and to go to it as, um, as learners and, you know, um, uh, knowledge seekers as opposed to people who have a you know, a solution in their back pocket that they just want to like, you know, um, find the right moment to put it on the table. Mm. Could I add something to that? You know, it's funny, um, having worked in state government for uh, 11 years at the state planning office and uh, seeing how the sausage is made, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, as a state, and I think it's probably true if, at, at the national level and everything, we seem to go all or nothing. Like um, uh, at some point, the answer, every answer to every question is community college. Let's invest in community college. You know, uh, for others, it's, you know, you don't need college because, you know, not everybody does well there or something. Some people aren't meant to go to college. It's like, it's an e we set up these either or situations instead of uh, a yes and situation where every part of the system is really important, uh, particularly for different, um, different sets of, of young people. And to your point, Javier, uh, um, uh, I didn't mean to suggest that we just abandon everything we're doing at the older age and just focus on the younger age. But I think it's just the long game here. Uh, it's a very long-term investment that we have to start making uh, if we're ever gonna truly transform um, the young people as, as they come through our system. So it's really a situation of, we gotta, we gotta fix the plane, you know, while we're flying it. And it's really important not to lose a step for the young people that are in your care or in your charge at whatever point they are to do everything you can for their success. Um, but at the same time, send up the flags to people who can do something different. Um, to make some other kinds of investment that maybe will save other young people having to take this really difficult path that didn't have to happen. Chris, did you want to say something? I have, I have, I have one thing that's a little bit of a, a tangent, but I, I don't think we can talk about investment in education without out mentioning the incredible support the Alphon Foundation has given to many organizations across the state, and you know, one of these, a few of these conversations have kind of 
walked around it and, and whether it's from their 529 program all the way up to the, the recent investments they've made in things like the Humane System and, and the Rue Institute and the phenomenal investment they've given us to make you know, advanced degrees um, affordable for Mainers, uh, you know, the, it, it is an incredible piece. And I just wanted to make sure that, you know, I know actually all of our organizations and many others across this state have received phenomenal support from that organization. So I just want to make sure that that's something that you know, we recognize their dedication to the state and and education um, as as a means of changing the futures of of the people of our state. So um, I know we're coming up on time, and it it seemed like it was one thing I want to make sure that I know. You know, we we've, we've we've all seen the impacts that that organization's made in the state, and and just a an amazing um, entity, and, and a, a thank you for the support that they give a lot of organizations. Yeah, thank you so much, Chris, for mentioning that. Very important, for sure. So it's just as a, as a last question, I wish I had two or three hours with you, <laughs> three, because I feel there's so much um, interesting to discuss here. But as a last question, is there anything that you would like either um, the business community, if you are, and Chris, maybe it's still for you, the business community, but I'm imagining you might choose something different. Um, either the business community or um, legislators, what would you want them to know about this, the importance of investment? And maybe you want to highlight something you've already said or, or maybe bring to light something you haven't had a chance to speak about yet. I mean, it's hard for me to, you know, to sort of to point to any one um, specific thing. I think all of the things that we've talked about are, you know, about the importance of investing um, in education. I think, you know, understanding that, um, you know, sort of going back to um, my um, grandmother, it's, you know, there's, uh, there's uh, nothing else in the world that can never be taken away from you other than what you, you know, what's inside your head and your, you know, soul as a result of your education. And so, you know, to just sort of hold that at the center and, you know, there's lots of, you know, there's lots of reasons, there's lots of different things that we as a society um, need to invest in, but I think you've heard it from all of us throughout is that, you know, without um, investing in the development of human capital, there's not, um, you know, there's nothing that, um, that we'll be able to do um, without making those investments. And I'll just sort of say that I'm really um, uh, happy and fortunate to, to be in the state of Maine, because I do think that that is not something that is really up for debate as much as it is in other places. And so I feel very, um, you know, fortunate having worked in, you know, in states where there isn't that same level of commitment to, you know, to education and um, true understanding of its, you know, the importance of, you know, developing human capital that I think we have in this state. And I think that's, you know, so, you know, to anybody who's watching who fits that, just, you know, know that I, I recognize that. I've got nothing to add. That was... So exactly probably what I would have said. So I'll, uh, I'll cede my time to Lori if she has anything else to add. Yeah, I would just say as uh, someone who studied this economy for a very, very long time and worked through, watched, you know, the front row seat for legislative process, everyone is very, very well intentioned. Um, but a lot of times we get kind of caught in our narrow view of the world and if you look at long-term over the horizon, what we are trying to achieve um, is we want a high quality of life for everyone in our state. And to do that in a knowledge-based, technology-driven global economy, you have to have that human capital. You have to have everyone engaged in the pursuit of prosperity um, and uh, engagement in our communities and our civic life and, and education is that key. Um, it doesn't immediately solve everything, but it is the biggest piece, uh, the, the largest ROI you can have on any investment that state government has or federal government um, is in the development of our people. Um, 
So in, if we can keep our eye on the prize, um, then we think more comprehensively, it's over the entire span of a human's life. It's, it's for everyone, whether they take a straight path or a very diverse path to get there. Um, it's every form of human development, like it's not just paying for the old reading, writing and arithmetic, it's music that unleashes potential in many students, it's art, it's, it is sports, it is those other things that people find their value in and because they find their own self-affirmation, all those other things can unleash the true um, educational piece to gain those other skills that are so critical. So we just need to, um, to look at the long game here and not just focus on the short run difficulties of making decisions and, and invest for this future of the state that we love so much. And for me, very biased, education is the answer to that. Well, I think that that's a really good way to end. Thank you, Lori, for summing it up so, so um, succinctly and so in such a heartfelt way too. Yeah. So thank you all for, for coming. And I do hope that you have a chance to look at the other conversations that we have um, on, the, on our website to, to take advantage of the learning that you might gain from listening to others speak about education.